I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Dominic Garcia, the Chief Investment Officer for the Public Employees Retirement Association of New Mexico, a $16 billion pension system that serves over 90,000 members and provides $1.2 billion in annual benefits. Dominic is a native of New Mexico, began his allocator career at New Mexico Para, and returned to rejoin the system in 2017 as Chief Investment Officer after nearly a decade at SWIB, the State of Wisconsin Investment Board. Our conversation covers Dominic's path to the helm at Para, challenges of governance and compensation in public pensions, addressing underfunding with variable liabilities, and his risk-based investment approach that includes the separation of alpha and beta, overlays, and the selection of alpha managers across public equities, hedge funds, and private markets. Dominic has three times been named in the 40 Under 40 by industry publications, and you'll soon hear why. Today's show is also sponsored by Coinbase Prime, a leading prime brokerage for digital assets. Coinbase provides the bridge to the crypto world for institutional investors, high net worth individuals, financial institutions, and corporate investors through their professional trading platform, deep and diversified liquidity, execution expertise, and Coinbase Custody, one of the largest and most trusted digital asset custodians. For institutions looking to enter the cryptocurrency markets, visit prime.coinbase.com. Today's show is also sponsored by Janice Henderson Investors. In an environment where allocators face more questions than answers, having a trusted partner is critical. Janice Henderson Investors is committed to building partnerships with institutional investors based on collaboration, insights, and transparency. With 26 offices and 350 investment professionals worldwide, Janice Henderson has the scale to offer a global perspective and the depth to offer local expertise and support. To learn more about partnering with Janice Henderson, visit JaniceHenderson.com slash institutional. Please enjoy my conversation with Dominic Garcia. Dominic, good to see you. Yeah, good seeing you. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Great. Well, let's just dive in. I mean, I know you're a New Mexican native, so why don't you walk me through that early part of your career and how you got involved in this business? Yeah, sure. So yes, I am a native New Mexican. Both my wife and I are from New Mexico, grew up here. Families have a long history here, generations. When I was young, I actually went to graduate school up in Chicago. This was back in 2001, around there. And I went to public policy school, and while I was up there at University of Chicago, I kind of fell in love with public finance and finance, doing a lot of study between the policy school and the business school, which wasn't Booth at the time, it was just GSB. And then after graduation, my wife and I, who was my girlfriend at the time, we decided to move back to New Mexico and get married. And I did, and so the first job I landed after graduate school was working for the New Mexico legislature and working in their finance committees. I started work and, and my boss came to me and he said, hey, look, I'm not satisfied with the amount of work we do on the pension funds and our sovereign wealth fund. Do you think you can handle this? And I was like, sure, I'll take it on. And so I jumped on. In New Mexico, we have two pensions, the public employees pensions and then the teachers pension. And then we have a 20 plus billion dollar sovereign wealth fund that's been funded from oil and gas oils for the past few decades. And so I started just analyzing and understanding them and And boy, everything just kind of clicked for me. And 12 months later, the CIO for the public employees pension said, hey, look, why don't you come on and be my deputy? And I said, sure, what the heck? And so I did that for about three years, I want to say, until about 2007. And for a very short period of time, my CIO, he retired. And so I was the CIO at like 28, 29 years old for like a quarter and the big benefit of that piece was I was able to go to NASIO, which is this big, the National Association of State Investment Officers, 
which is this big gathering every year where all the state pension CIOs come together and we just talk about issues. I was just this green-eyed kid listening and listening and super nervous about talking. And I was able to meet David Villa for the first time when I was up there. And David Villa is this, now the executive director and CIO at Wisconsin. And at that time, he just started and I got to know him. And, and little did I know that he was also a native of New Mexico. And so we just started talking a bit, getting to know each other. And I told him about how I think about portfolios, what I would like to do. And, and he was telling me about how he started at Wisconsin and what he would like to do. And boy, things just clicked. We took a taxi ride together to the airport when the conference is over. And a couple of months later, I got a recruiting call. And I guess the rest is history after that. So why don't you take me back before you joined SWIB? And we'll obviously circle back to this as you return, but what did the portfolio look like? You're still young and learning the business. So the work I did as the deputy at Para back in those days is we lived on a legal list of investments. So what that was, was in statute, it basically said, thou shall invest in this and thou shall not invest in that. And really what it meant was you can buy government bonds, you can buy U.S. equities, and you can only buy up to 25, 30% of non-U.S. equities. And so it was very restrictive and it was only publics. And so this was back in 2004, 2005. And so at that time, the big push that we had was moving from this, what we called the legal list of investing to the Prudent Investor Act, which would allow us to go into alternatives in effect. And so since I just built up some goodwill at the legislature here in New Mexico and moved over at the time, that was really the big push that I had kind of helped out on. And so back in 2004, 2005, all the New Mexico pensions and the Sovereign Wealth Fund, we all moved off the legal list and onto the Prudent Investor Act. And so all three of us, all the three of the funds, and particularly the pension, that started our race to ramp up to alternatives. And so being a deputy at the time, it was really about building the foundation for ramping up to alternatives. And and as I left, I think I allocated maybe some of the first dollars into private equity and real estate and hedge funds at the time. So you, so you left just when the going was getting good? I'd kind of set the floor or the foundation or help set it, I should say. And then whoever came after, they built up a lot of the allocations. So why don't you talk a bit about your experience at SWIB? So SWIB is, well, first of all, I was there almost a decade and, and it was just a magnificent experience. First of all, I think SWIB is a best-in-class public pension on a number of fronts here in the United States, and I think even globally. But my experience there at SWIB was, David, I think, had a very ambitious vision, and he still is, and it's still accomplishing that to this day. I was fortunate to be an early part of that. I think what we tried to do, and what they continue to do, is separate beta and alpha at the very simplest level in the portfolio. And my role in building out the beta and alpha, but also utilizing internal management as kind of the core as the core and external management as more of an alpha generating source as well. And so my role evolved over time. I started off just in the fixed income team, working with the internal fixed income teams and building external solutions just to optimize the fixed income portfolio and the alpha portfolio. And after time, it evolved into a role of just focusing on external alpha. And so at SWIB, what I really worked on was building from scratch, alpha strategies and hedge funds and traditional long only strategies, but also helping out on the risk parity approach. And so I had a baptism by fire and it was just a wonderful experience. And what I would consider just a, a laboratory of trying to build the best ideas, the best types of portfolios and really separating beta and alpha and figuring out how you can optimize an alpha portfolio with internal management and external management mixed in. And so it was a wonderful experience. And I think some of the best things that I learned was portfolio construction and understanding that we're not capital allocators, we're actually risk allocators first. And so always having this risk perspective first, what factors, what macro factors are you allocating to? How much risk does it contribute? What's your left tail? And really being more of a risk manager than anything else. And I think that was number one. Number two is I think SWIB, because it is such a leader and has a great model for how pensions should be managed, I learned how you should build a pension system in general, not just a portfolio. And I was able to interact with a lot of the Canadian pensions, the European pensions, and even the Australians and, and New Zealand pensions in comparative analysis of best-in-class 
pension building. And so I think that was maybe my greatest takeaway was recognizing that this defined benefit program is such a wonderful thing for participants. And if you manage it well, it works very well and has a lot of efficiency. And SWIB is kind of the gold standard from that. And I was able to take away some key pillars and some key principles of what made SWIB successful and and hopefully took that to heart and hopefully others can learn from that as well. That's really what brought me back home is really understanding those principles. Before we dive into the investing, when you come back, you're now retaking the seat. One of the common beliefs and truisms in many public pension funds are the challenges of governance. So it's one thing to have a thoughtful investment model. It's another thing to actually get it done. So what was it that you saw at SWIB that you tried to bring back that allows you to take some of the constraints that many public pensions have and then implement them in the same type of seat? Yeah, I think what I realized and learned is that governance is central to success for any institution, but particularly for public pensions. And I think the governance at SWIB is unique in two ways. First of all, the pension system is separated into two parts. There's the pension administration organization, and then there's SWIB. That's really just the asset management piece. And so it allowed SWIB to actually act and function and talk and walk more like a private asset manager. And so what that led to was having a board that was highly professionalized, small, and focused on the strategic role that they had. And having that strategic role and setting strategic goals And then delegating down to staff and making sure that the staff had clear goals, clear evaluative metrics, and had the resources to achieve those objectives. But in addition to that, had the resources to attract and retain talent. And so those were the key pieces that I've seen for SWIB that were big successes for SWIB and elsewhere outside of, in Canada, frankly, the Canadian plans kind of have that same model as well. That key phrase you said, the resources to uh, attract and retain talent. How does that work in a public pension fund? Yeah, it's difficult. When you look at the public pension plan landscape in the United States, I would say about half of the pensions have the ability to pay an incentive compensation for for pensions. Most are still stuck on government-focused pay bans, right? And I think they create a misalignment with what pension investment staff are trying to create. So I think you have this dichotomy. You have some plans that have nice alignment with incentives and the ability to pay folks relatively well relative to the industry. And then you have this other half who are still stuck in the past of how they pay and think of the value proposition for its investment staff employees. And so for that other half, it becomes a difficult thing to attract and retain talent because you have to compete. You know, you have to compete not only against those other 50% in the public pension world, but you got to compete against endowments, foundations, and corporate pensions. And, and so it is a challenge. And in my experience, I think that's been one of my biggest challenges in the role that I have today. So is there something in the governance or the budget that allows certain public pensions to pay people more than other public pensions would? There is. So it really depends on the system. I'll give you an example. So for us here in New Mexico, our budget is still based off Our board sets our budget, but then it goes through the legislative process still, right? And so we still have to go get approval every year from the legislature and then subsequently from the governor. In other pension systems where I talked about that other half where they have some incentive comp, they're allowed to have flexibility in their budget. So like at SWIB, they were able to have a basis point band for building their budget, which meant that as long as they're within some level of a basis point or expense ratio cost relative to the total assets, SWIB had the flexibility to build out its own budget. We, on the other hand, don't have that, right? And and we still are part of the government-wide personnel system. Having some exemption from that would be a huge boon. And I think a handful of public pensions have that as well. That would be a huge boon. There's a big question of like, how do you actually get there? Or can you? It's a challenge. I've been here a little over three years, and we've done a lot to change the way we do business. But That one, the compensation and setting our own budget and personnel, that one is the most elusive of all. And it really gets down to a much different type of conversation with policymakers and your board about how they view staff and the value proposition of staff. And it's a very difficult issue. It's proven to be the most elusive that I've tried to encounter. 
So let's turn to the investment side. And I guess the first question I would ask is, given those realities of the challenge in probably being able to attract and retain quality people, how does that influence how you think about the investment process? I think there's a couple of things. One is when you build out your investment process or your investment team, I think there's a couple of things. You know, From our standpoint, we take on the philosophy of let's separate alpha and beta in not only public assets, but also private assets. Let's be risk managers and risk allocators first and then not capital allocators per se. And so that's kind of where we start. But then the second thing is, is, you know, okay, how do you implement? You could either implement through internal means or through external means. And so when you kind of have a, a strained personnel or a strained compensation structure, it's very difficult to do any internal asset management. Then the internal asset management mainly helps in cost reduction and it saves quite a bit of money over a five to 10 year period of time. So we actually end up being 100% external. And so what's important for me is to have a staff and a talent base of our staff that is very versed and seasoned about how to buy and structure external strategies. And so when I actually find the talent because of our strange personnel situation, I tend to skew on the younger side. And so what I tend to do is I offer more, the value proposition I offer folks are you have more autonomy, you have more ability for innovation and growth and learning. And that is an attractive substitute for the comp that I can't offer or that others can offer elsewhere. So it tends to skew a little bit younger, but the ability to work in a more dynamic or environment with more autonomy and more responsibility, I think that's been the trade-off. And it's so far it's worked. The trouble is when those folks get a little older, they're a lot more marketable. The issue is really going to be retaining in that model. All right. So you mentioned the separation of alpha and beta. As you think about the portfolio, how do you first go about approaching that challenge? So the first thing that we really think about is, all right, we have these funding objectives in the total plan. And so based on those funding objectives, what's the amount of risk we need to take in the portfolio to meet our return hurdles? And so first is setting the appropriate amount of total risk. And then second is saying, okay, And then I'll just use it as an example. Let's say the total risk that we want to take over a long period of time, call it 10 plus years, is about 11% volatility. So what we do is we take that 11% volatility and we say, well, we're going to break it into two pieces. And we call this our risk budget. So the first piece is going to be our beta or our asset allocation. And this will drive most of our volatility. And what we say is, okay, we're going to build an allocation on our betas, but we're going to be very mindful of the risk it generates to three macro factors. And one is growth, inflation, and rates. We're going to allocate that beta so that we can meet that risk objective and more importantly, that return objective. But we're going to ensure that we have diversification so that we're being as diversified to those three macro factors as possible. So that's beta. And then so in alpha space, we'll say, you know what? In addition to the risk we're taking in asset allocation space or beta, we want to take up to another 2% tracking error relative to that beta that we're taking. And up to that additional 2% tracking error, we think we can generate 1% excess return or alpha. And so what we do is we literally separate those two things into risk budgets. And so we'll optimize a risk budget based off of those betas. And there's really only uh, half a dozen betas that we allocate to in reality. But in alpha space, we have about 26 different opportunity sets that we will allocate to. And we'll optimize those two things completely separately. And then we'll allow for overlays and et cetera in the alpha book so that we ensure that we're separating and ensuring that we're not doing double duty with the beta. And so when you separate those two things, optimize them individually and bring them back together, what ends up happening is your alpha book tends to be quite low correlated to your beta book. And so the total risk it generates is quite low. So what you're getting is just an overall improvement in your risk return ratio at the total plan. But for us, we explicitly set two risk budgets for each and then bring them back together. And then we manage to those risk budgets. So let's start with the beta book. What's your, just to state it out, what's your actuarial rate of return on the plan? We're at seven and a quarter percent. Okay. So given market conditions where they are now, how do you come close to getting to that seven and a quarter? 
Great question. So a couple of things is, as you know, if you were a 60-40 investor for the last 30 years, you generated 8 to 9%. But the thing is that 8 to 9%, half of that over the last 30 years was just from cash. And so your cash return now is probably zero. And so how do you generate enough with a cash rate of zero? And for us, just beta alone and the allocations that we have, I think is going to get you 5 to 6%. And so what we're looking into right now is what if you incorporate appropriate leverage on your assets in the beta book? Can you get an extra 50 to 100 basis points out of that? And so I think that's a key challenge and a key issue for folks going forward. And so for us, what we're looking at is in our beta book, we're looking to incorporate embedded leverage in the asset classes and then about in a very modest amount, which is about 10% at the total asset allocation level. So we think we can get somewhere around a 6%-ish, 6 to 6 and a quarter percent in just the beta book with that. And then the alpha, we still think we can generate about a 1% alpha going forward. Obviously, that's a much more difficult thing to achieve and et cetera. But, but I think when you put those two together, you can get to about a 7 and a quarter percent return. On top of that, I know the plan is currently underfunded or is underfunded when you got in. So how do you think about sort of catching up in addition to what you need to make? Yeah, so this is probably one of the best things that happened for us in 2020. Again, taking a playbook from SWIB and other plans that have done really well on a funding sustainability perspective. In 2020, we were able to get a pension reform passed and it did two big things for us. The first is it increased our contribution rates near our ARC or the actuarial required contribution. And the second thing is it created a variable COLA for us. And this is a very big deal. So prior to this change, our benefit structure, the day somebody retired, they had a base benefit, the promised guaranteed benefit that we're going to provide. But a year later, they had a fixed guaranteed COLA that they were going to receive. And so what we did in 2020 was we decoupled those two things. We said, you're still going to get this promise benefit forever. But going forward, whatever COLA you receive, it's going to be now be a profit share. It's going to be based off of the funding level and the returns that we generate. So what that means is our actual base benefit, the cost to pay that base benefit, is actually more like 55 to 6% investment cost. And so going forward... If we can exceed that base cost of 55 to 6%, then we will share those gains in a profit share COLA. So going forward, we are on a much more sustainable path and we project over the next 25 plus years that we'll be close to being a fully funded plan. And so what this new structure allows us to do is if we generate returns over and above that base cost, not only are we sharing that with our participants in a profit share COLA, but we're also taking a portion of that and banking it to the unfunded liability over time. And so this funding mechanism is a much better and holistic strategy going forward. And so I jest, but that was our best investment strategy of 2020. And it really sets this plan. This plan will be here for the next couple of generations, just based on that. How pervasively was that adjustment adopted across public pensions in the U.S.? I'm not sure. I think there's a handful of plans that do this. Obviously, SWIB has a variable payment on their COLA. South Dakota has something similar. There's really only a handful that have this. I think we're one of the few that were able to get something done over the last year or two. But this is something that I think across the country, public pensions are going to have to deal with, either raising contributions, changing the benefit of some sort, or having some other asset-based solution to help fill that hole of unfunded liability. So let's turn to this alpha piece. Easy word to say, a little bit harder to execute in the market. So you mentioned 26 different strategies. Where do you like to play in that space? So the first thing is we view private assets as not asset classes. We view private assets as another way to access active management or alpha. So at a very high level, we're building three big books, three alpha lines or business lines. We're building a long biased alpha line So in non-U.S. equities, emerging market equities, small cap equities, long only based strategies. But what we're doing is we're making sure that those strategies have a high concentration, high active share. We're not buying benchmark huggers. We're buying things that zig and that we expect 
two to three percent alpha out of them over time. The same is true as in fixed income. We're doing similar things in fixed income, alternative credit, and then on to REITs and listed infrastructure and real estate. So we have a book. We have 32 different individual strategies that were invested in, in just long only, long biased alpha management. And then in addition to that, what we're doing is we're buying hedge funds. We're buying market neutral hedge funds because on a risk adjusted basis, hedge funds are still pound for pound the best alpha generators. And so what we're doing is we're building a market neutral hedge fund portfolio we think can generate something around a 3% excess return or alpha over cash. And then we're porting it over our bonds. So we're making it a portable alpha structure. And then the last piece is we view private assets as alpha generators. And what we do is we take a very distinct approach. We build out PMEs, public market equivalents for all of our private assets, and we optimize around a direct alpha. And so what we're doing is we'll take our private equity, our private credit, our private real estate, and our private infrastructure assets We'll put those all into one book and we're expecting them to generate a three to 4% alpha or direct alpha over our PME. So those are the areas that we play heavily. So long bias strategies that, that take high amount of tracking error that are more concentrated, take high active risk. We really like market neutral hedge funds that are more persistent, really idiosyncratic risk oriented. And then we're looking at private equity private real estate and private infrastructure as big drivers of direct alphas relative to their public market PMEs. And when you put all those together, that alpha book turns out to be around one and a half to 2% of vol in of itself. And we think that can generate about a 1% alpha at the total plan level. I'm curious how you've got the beta book on one side and then this alpha book, like two of these three buckets have a lot of embedded beta when you put it together, right? The, the market neutral hedge funds don't, but the rest of them, you're owning assets and somehow that's tied to the economy and growth and you know, inflation and rates. How do you port that back so that you just have that alpha stream and with low correlation? So it really gets back to our risk budgeting process. So I'll take an example. Let's say our private equity portfolio. So private equity in a very simplistic way has maybe two return streams. Relative to our beta book, private equity, we're benchmarking to the MSCI world. So if our private equity book is going to have X amount of exposure to MSCI world, and then it's going to have a Y amount of exposure that's idiosyncratic tracking error relative to MSCI world. And so private equity in general is going to have something around 10% tracking error to MSCI world over time. So we take that tracking error and we put that into our alpha book. But the exposures that are MSCI world, that is in the beta book. And so we have to use our technology process to ensure that that tracking error is well evaluated and well measured. And so we're doing that with anything that has any beta attached to it. We're making sure that the right amount of risk is measured and accounted for in the beta book. And then the residual idiosyncratic risk or tracking error is is in the alpha book. But in addition to that, we also have two overlays. And so what we do is, for instance, let's say we like active management in non-U.S. equities or in small cap equities. But non-U.S. equities relative to the MSCI world will generate two risks. It'll have a geographic risk and then the stock picking risk or the idiosyncratic risk. All we care about is the stock picking and idiosyncratic risk. So what we'll do is we'll have an overlay that hedges that geographic risk or that cap risk back to our benchmarks or back to our beta book so that all that's left is the residual idiosyncratic risk. And then in addition to that, and this is true in our credit portfolio, some of our credit strategies tend to have a beta that's 0.5 relative to the high yield index. So we'll actually have a synthetic CDX or IBOX overlay to put us back up to beta of one. So we're making sure that we're always at best a beta of one matching back to our beta risk budget and that all that's left over in our active strategies is mostly idiosyncratic alpha oriented return streams. How do you go about implementing those overlays? We have two providers that help us with that. And so what they do is we give them a look into our portfolio 
at least on a monthly basis, we'll talk with them and make sure we're both seeing the same amount of risk. And then they'll put on those different hedges on a monthly basis to ensure that we're minimizing the risk that we're looking for. And again, it all starts with our risk budget. So because of our risk budget, we're able to have a very specific and directed conversation with those overlay managers of what we're trying to stamp out. Where does some of the slippage happen in the private assets? On our beta book, all of our benchmarks are public oriented. And so the biggest slippage that we have is having this valuation lag relative to our public markets. And so the tracking error that we're generating from our private assets, a good chunk of that is really this lagged effect relative to our public market equivalents. It catches up over a three-year rolling, a five-year rolling period, but that's really where the slippage is, is trying to measure your private assets back to a public market equivalent and trying to ensure that that smoothing or lagging effect is minimized when you're really evaluating. There's some statistical maneuvers that you got to do to do that, but there's never a perfect fit for that. How substantial are the overlays relative to just owning the assets in that exercise of getting to the reference portfolio that you want with the betas? It depends on your point of view. So the notional amounts are fairly large, maybe a billion. For us, we're a $16 billion plan. So the notional amounts could be a billion dollars or so. But the actual cash exchanged is really more like 20 to $30 million. So it's really a modest cash exchange because the overlays, again, we're buying and selling markets. So for instance, we're going to be long MSCI World and short Japan, or just as an example, what you're really hedging out is that residual. And so there's not a lot of volatility to it, but the notionals can be fairly, fairly large. Over the years as you've been doing that, how's the math worked out in terms of P&L of the overlays relative to the smoothing of volatility from the exercise? Yeah, so we expect the overlays to be a zero contributor over time because all we're doing is we're minimizing the risk that we don't want and emphasizing the risk that we do want. And the risk that we don't want, it should produce a zero. So we expect zero with the overlays. We've actually been a little bit ahead on the overlays, but our expectation is not to make any money. It's to minimize our risk. Let's dive in a little bit on the manager selection process. You know, as we mentioned at the top, a little bit resource constrained, competitive world. So how do you go about trying to find the managers you want to have that generate alpha? Take a step back and let's talk governance first before I go into manager selection. So as I started, one of the first things that I engaged our board with was I said, hey, look, if we're going to try to do things better, the first thing we got to do is we got to change our investment governance. So what our governance looks like today is our board makes three decisions. They set our overall risk tolerance. They approve our risk budget as what I've been talking about, and they set benchmarks. Everything else gets delegated down to staff. So the manager selection process is delegated entirely down to me and our staff. And so what our marching orders are is implement the risk budget, basically, maybe do a little better. And so manager selection, it turns out, works pretty well in that governance structure. So I'm fortunate that I have staff that are quite skilled and knowledgeable about the external manager universe and being able to build unique fund of one structures. And so what we've done is we've built a pretty thorough internal process of manager diligence. So I'll have staff, which I call my alpha team, they're focused on each one of those three business lines that I mentioned. And so they kind of lead the process and they lead diligence. And we work with, in parallel, we work with consultants in each one of those buckets to kind of help us along in terms of sourcing, et cetera. But our internal process, I think, is pretty robust in a sense that we've built out a very detailed uh, diligence process. And then what we do is we also create an alpha score on our managers. The alpha score for us is about a 14 different metrics that we score all of our managers on. And what we do from that scoring process is we say, okay, out of that, we build out conviction in our managers. So our managers can have a four or they can have a two, depending on that alpha score. And if you have a four, anywhere between a four and a two, based on our scoring method, if you have a four, we want to allocate more risk to you. If you have a two, you know, we're going to give you less risk. And so this alpha scoring process, our diligence process, our risk budget, then feeds how we actually allocate risk and capital to our managers. And then we have a pretty nice monitoring process in that. So for us, what I think is we do have a modest staff, 
But what's been really, really nice is being able to build out a very systematic process, add in consultants, and then add in technology. And I think that helps us really manage well the Alpha Book with a modest staff. And I, I feel like it would be nice to have a little bit more staff, but honestly, I think I feel good about where we're at in managing that Alpha Book. What are the types of managers that you prefer? In our Alpha Score, I would say there's a couple of things. I think from a quantitative point of view, a manager that their return stream is really oriented towards idiosyncratic risk. If we are able to break down their return stream, they have a modest amount of beta in their excess return stream. They have a, a modest amount of factor exposures, and they really have mostly idiosyncratic risk. I think that's really important. The second thing is I like managers that really build a moat, that have really have a sustainable edge to what they're trying to do. And then they build their entire business around that sustainable edge. But in addition to that, they take risk with high conviction, meaning they really focus a lot of their risk and capital into their best ideas, not into their second tier ideas. And so they're able to allocate that capital and allocate that risk to their best ideas very well. And I think that's actually a key attribute to sustainable alpha production for managers is not just that they can find a good idea, but that they're allocating the right amount of capital to those good ideas and not to necessarily the second tier ideas. So then I think the other piece is qualitatively is I really appreciate a manager that has high alignment to us. And I think alignment means that we're in the same boat. They have skin in the game. They eat their own cooking. They have a large amount of their own capital in the same strategies and that they're very aware of their fees. Everybody would love less fees, but I think what's more important for us is that the fees that we're paying, we're getting a good deal based on the alpha. And so we like to call it a capture ratio. So based on the gross alpha that a manager can generate, we're trying to get to 60 to 70% capture ratio of that gross. And a manager that understands that and is able to be flexible with us in constructing fee structures, I think that's a really important piece for us. So I'm wondering if we could pry into this a little bit. You know, I have in my head the two or three or four large hedge funds that are market neutral, that are idiosyncratic, and just almost on paper, you know who they are. Think of one that's in your portfolio and one that isn't. You don't have to say the names, but what are the examples of what is it that's that subtle thing that distinguishes the two? So I think the subtle difference is sustainability, persistence, consistency of their alpha. And so that's a very quantitative analysis on a lot of measures. And I think that becomes very important is it's very hard to forecast alphas, but you need to have good confidence that what you're buying can be persistent going forward. And I think part of the big reason for that is past data. And so I think that's very important. The second subtle difference I would say is, is that firm? Is that firm philosophically orienting themselves to alpha generation? Are they philosophically oriented to what we're trying to accomplish or at least empathizing with what we're trying to accomplish? Or are they just saying, you know what, I'm just here to gather assets and I'm here just you're either in or you're out. It doesn't matter. Specifically in the hedge fund land, I'm a big proponent advocate of hedge funds. I think pound for pound on a risk adjusted basis, they're some of the best asset managers on the planet. But I think a majority of the hedge fund world has a big beta attached to it. And so there's a different philosophy with that type of manager and the way they run their business, the way they interact with clients and the type of clients that they have. That doesn't fit for us very well. What really fits for us is somebody that is really idiosyncratic driven, trying to squeeze out all the beta it can in that portfolio and, and trying to be really almost 100% skill-based. Now, that tends to maybe have a little bit of a lower return profile, but that's okay for us because we're porting them over something else. And so managers that understand what they're being used for in their portfolio I think that's a differentiator for us. And when you're playing with an asset size that big and you get into the private markets, how do you pick where to go after your spots? 
I think the private assets are more of a challenge. And what I'm going to say is, I kind of talked a little bit about my initial start into this industry, but part of it was building the hedge fund portfolio back in 2004, 2005. And if you go back to hedge funds, you know, a decade or a decade and a half ago, it was an industry that was a little bit more black box and you just kind of signed up for things. And between now and then, hedge funds have really institutionalized, right? It's really matured as an industry, really transparent, et cetera. When you go to the private asset world and particularly, let's say, private equity, I think private equity is where hedge funds were like a decade ago or so, right? It's a very more networky type industry. You kind of sign up. I think private equity and the private asset classes are going to institutionalize and mature going forward. I think data, quantitative analysis is just really burgeoning into those private assets, similar to what happened in hedge funds a decade or a decade and a half ago. And I think that's really going to change how allocators look at and select managers. For instance, and I'm going to give you an example for us. We actually have a paper out on this that we produced with uh, Landmark Partners. We focus a lot on direct alpha and excess value. I think a lot of investors, if not almost all investors, when they buy a private equity strategy or a manager, they look at IRR, right? They look at IRR, TVPI, what's the total return? We look at direct alphas, KSPMEs. The reason why you buy private equity isn't for the total return. In my view, it's the relative return to your PME because a private equity portfolio or private equity manager, let me just give you an example. Let's say they generate a 12% IRR. Well, if you actually broke out that 12% IRR, 8 to 10% of that is just simple beta that you can get for one to two basis points. And we're paying fees on that whole thing. The reason why you want private equity is because they can produce a spread over that PME and they have offer you a smoothing kind of mechanism. So the more you're able to analyze private equity managers on that direct alpha, on their excess value, the idiosyncratic risk they generate, there's going to be a lot more differentiation of what you buy and what you don't buy. To me, that's extremely analogous to the way we think of the hedge fund portfolio or your traditional long-only portfolio. It's the same analytical process, the same diligence process. It just takes a little more data work. And that's the way we treat our private assets. We're differentiating and we're differentiating them in that same way. So as you look out into this year and beyond, what are the opportunities you're most excited about? I think, as we kind of alluded to, beta, I think, is going to be challenged over the medium and long term. I think over the short run, maybe 12 to 24 months, you could see a continuation of what we're seeing. But over the medium and long term, I think generating the returns that you've seen in the past is going to be difficult in beta. So I really think alpha, and I think alpha across the board is going to be pretty attractive. I particularly think hedge funds should be a great space going forward. There should be a lot of uh, dispersion amongst what happens in industries, dispersion amongst companies, even dispersion amongst geographies. In my mind, the more unconstrained strategies, and those are typically hedge funds, can I think you can eke out more excess value that way. I think private assets will continue to do well. In the private asset area, I'm pretty enthusiastic about infrastructure. I think infrastructure, both from a beta and alpha perspective, is quite attractive. The underlying components of infrastructure align really well with a pension system. And given low returns on on bonds and cash, I could see investors using infrastructure as a replacement somewhat for that. And I think infrastructure is going to be a very interesting place to be in the United States, just from a public good point of view. I like those areas, but overall, I would say I'm bullish alpha. If you're going to seek managers that that look for idiosyncratic risk and are going to take higher amount of all. How do you in your seat, or probably in any public pension setting, think about something brand new like People are talking about the whole digital asset world now with the rise in price of Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrency assets. How do you think of a clearly an idiosyncratic potential return stream, but also in a public pension fund setting? It's difficult. And again, and I think the reason why that's difficult is in a public pension setting or any long-term institutional asset owner think should be thinking over the long term. You know, And to me, that's 10 plus years, 10, 20, 30 years. And so when you do that, um, we don't buy something and look to trade it, buy it, put it in the portfolio and sell it a year later. That's just, that's just something that we're not going to do. And 
And quite frankly, I think folks that do that, there's a, a light track record and success for that. So when you're actually looking to put a strategy into your portfolio, you're expecting it to be in for five, 10 plus years. And so when you do that, I think you need confidence that it will not necessarily perform, but it will behave how you expect. And so something that's brand new, there's truly no way to expect how it's going to behave over the next five to 10 years because there's no data to back it up. It's truly a speculative endeavor. I don't want to pick on Bitcoin, but let's say new thing A, how does it perform in an inflation scenario? How does it perform in a growth scenario? Heaven knows, right? And so when you're building a portfolio of betas and alphas that are based on allocating diversified risk, where do you plug something that's brand new when you have no clue how it's going to perform in different economic environments? In terms of Bitcoin, I'm willing to eat crow on this, but Bitcoin is, I think, a burgeoning replacement of literally currency and gold. But I think the main challenge there is our government's going to sponsor that. If governments are not going to embrace it, it honestly, it should go down to just the technology value of it. Well, great, Dominic. Super interesting. I want to make sure we leave some time for some closing questions. So why don't we dive into that? What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? I live here in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And for those of you that don't know Santa Fe, we're about 7,000 feet up. Beautiful scenery, beautiful weather, beautiful culture. I live at the foothills of the mountains here. So I do a lot of trail running. I really love the trail running. Running at 7,000 feet, going up and down all the trails and hills and mountains. It's just uh, gratifying, challenging, all the above. What's your most important daily habit? I do 20 to 30 minutes of yoga and meditation in the mornings. And I think that kind of sets me up for the full day, evens out my, uh, my emotional state and my mental state. I run nearly daily as well. So I think those things combined are probably my most important daily habits. What's your favorite book? Ooh, good question. I'm a big fan of Way of the Warrior. I don't know if you've seen this, about the spiritual journey of doing the pilgrimage of Santiago in northern Spain and getting to your, uh, your spiritual IQ. And I really appreciate those. So in addition to my favorite book, I think some recent writings that I liked are, uh, one, I appreciate Ken Akundi's blog. I like reading that regularly. I think he has great insights on technology, which I've really helped used in what we're trying to build in our technology. And bringing his advice, I think, has been helpful. That's a more recent thing that I've appreciated. What's your biggest pet peeve? I think someone who is uncompromising. Somebody who doesn't see that on pretty much every issue, there's two sides, whether it's political, investment, whatever it is, there's always two sides to a story. And so I think somebody that doesn't take that into account or able to see both sides of things, that irks me. And how about in the investment world? What rankles you the most? I think when marketers say, you know, you kind of got to act now, right? Like, oh, we're, our closing is July 1st. And if you don't do it then, you won't get this. And I don't like act now. That doesn't sit well with me. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? When I was a kid, my dad used to listen to motivational tapes. So a lot of like Dale Carnegie, those types of folks. I soaked a lot of that up. And my dad used to always say a positive mental attitude can overcome anything. A positive mental attitude is kind of what sets the world ablaze. And so that's always set with me is be optimistic, have a positive mental attitude, no matter what comes. Dominic, I got one more for you, and then we'll let you go for our listeners, and we'll keep you on for our premium members so they can hear a little bit about mistakes you've made. And that last one is, what life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? This was a recent book that I read, and it talks about this idea of be, do, have. So you want to focus on being first, doing second, and then whatever you want, materialistic or have, comes last. For me, I think I had it the reverse when I was younger, and I think most people do. I looked at what do I want or what do I want to have first, what do I need to do to get that, and then I'll be whatever I be to have that. So I've learned to do the reverse, which means to focus on your passion first and what you care about, and then everything else kind of falls into place. That's great. Dominic, thanks so much. Super interesting. 
Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. An important disclaimer from Janice Henderson Group, PLC. Investing involves risk, including the possible loss of principle and fluctuation of value.